I watched it in sort of a maybe a peculiar unorthodox way that I'm excited to sort of hop into maybe a, a little bit deeper into this episode of uh, Death Blart. Um, Tell us now. I, I'm sick of everyone precursoring all of these comments. Tell us now. Give us the yeah, juice. Sure, I guess I'll just go ahead and tell you that I did, in fact, watch it synced up with uh, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is not a joke. I and watched the entire movie as underscored by... On Thanksgiving Day 2017, the hosts of the podcast Till Death Do Us Blart released their third annual episode. They watch and review the film Paul Blart Mall Cop 2 every year. But this year, one of the hosts, Griffin McElroy, put a twist on his viewing. He synced up the film to Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. This is a reference to a long famous stoner activity slash conspiracy theory that people call Dark Side of the Rainbow. It's the action of sinking Dark Side of the Moon up to the Wizard of Oz. I can't find any articles on when or who or why this all started, but according to Wikipedia, it only appeared as recently as 1995. Uh, around then, a man named Charles Savage wrote an article about it in the Fort Wayne, Indiana Journal Gazette. But even he references other parties trying to perfect this weird cocktail. When paired, these two pieces of art result in a handful of interesting synchronicities. Lyrics match up to events on screen, there are rhythmic similarities, there are some shared thematic elements. Not to mention that the album cover features a transition from black and white to a full color spectrum. Like, like happens in the movie. In the movie, if you remember, that happens. Um, most people accept this as a coincidence that's still really fun to watch if you've smoked enough, but some insist that it was the band's intent, even though the people in the band have said a whole bunch of times that it wasn't, which is very classy of them because it would be so easy for them to just say, like, yeah, we did that, that was all us. But regardless of artists' intent, or lack thereof, Dark Side of the Rainbow has been a popular urban legend for decades, and it continues to be meaningful to budding young stoners to this day. Griffin McElroy, after watching Paul Blart Mall Cop 2 in a similar fashion, cites a lot of really similar synchronicities, arguably even more than you can point out in Wizard of Oz. And that was what got me thinking. Is Wizard of Oz really synchronous to Dark Side of the Moon objectively, scientifically? Would any other randomly selected movie be just as good, if not a better pairing for the album? Did the phenomenon start because there was something really there, or just because somebody thought to try it? I wanted to answer this question scientifically, so I conducted an experiment. I watched a handful of movies from all different periods and genres, all synced up to the album in question. In an effort to be as unbiased as possible in this very scientific experiment, I concocted a point system. If at any point the lyrics of a song match up to an action happening on screen, that's three points. If an action or cut syncs up rhythmically, that's also three points. If a song's lyrics match the movie thematically, that's two. And if a song just serves as a good score to a scene, like, like it just has the same vibe, you know? Like it's just, a vibe is worth one point. Only one point for a vibe. These are my very objective and scientific parameters. They are perfect and completely unquestionable. For this experiment, I'm going to watch a magical family adventure from the 30s, a shitty cash cow comedy from 2014, a modern mega blockbuster sci-fi action film, a groundbreaking art horror movie from 1980, a beloved animated neoclassic from 2001, and an auteur family crime drama from 1972. I picked these movies because they represent a wide range of different tones and genres. They reflect a broad spectrum of filmmaking, and I did not pick them because I knew that if I picked those ones, I could put Shrek and Thanos in the thumbnail on YouTube. That has nothing to do with it. So in this system, longer movies are probably going to have higher scores just because there's more time and more opportunities for synchronicity. The Godfather is almost two times as long as Paul Blart Mall Cop 2, so it has a clear advantage. 
Uh, to avoid this problem, I'm going to take the raw number of points a movie earned and divide it by its runtime in minutes, giving us a more weighted number. I'm gonna call this number a Floyd quotient. So for example, if a movie scored 100 points and was 100 minutes long, it would have a Floyd quotient of one. If the same movie scored 50 points, its Floyd quotient would be 0.5. 100 minutes divided by 50 points would, or 50 points, yeah, 50 points divided by 100 minutes, 0.5. It makes sense, it's all there, I know what I'm doing. So, now, it's time to quit stalling and actually get to work on it. I synced up the album to the most well-known point, the third MGM Lion Roar. For each of these movies, I'm going to start the album right at the very beginning. Just whenever the beginning of the movie is, when you watch it on iTunes, Amazon, whatever that might be, that's where I'm gonna start. But for movies like Wizard of Oz, where there is a, a specific urban legend start point, I'm gonna start there instead. I have to say, I do now understand why this has stood the test of time as an urban legend. There are like some really insane moments in this. Near the beginning, Miss Gulch shows up right as these alarms are all going off in the album. Like, just like, danger, danger, she's gonna kill your dog if you don't get out of there. Why, oh, why can't Great Gig in the Sky starts right as the tornado touches down and then transitions into this soft reprieve right as Dorothy passes out. And then right afterwards, money starts, like as soon as she steps into Oz, like into color for the first time. It's, it's crazy, it's insane. The album is only playing just this ominous heartbeat during the song called, If I Only Had a Heart. I'd be friends with the sparrows and the boy who shoots the arrows if I only had a heart. Dorothy passes out again, right as the singer sings the words, one step closer to death. You can't rest now, every day. One day closer to death. Don't cry, you'll rust yourself again. Dorothy passes out a lot in this movie. She wakes up in Kansas at the end, right as the singer sings the lyrics, Home Again. It's insane, the timing on that is so crazy. Wake up, honey. And these synchronicities are really fun, but sometimes there are points where the music doesn't just match the movie, but it adds extra meaning and extra layers to the story being told. The big climactic battle at the end happens during the song called Us and Them, which is a song about like the senseless yet inevitable nature of violence and conflict in the world. But it also plays during the second half of Munchkinland, as they're sending Dorothy off on this mission to destroy the witch. It gives this movie this weird thematic idea of retaliation. It almost paints the Munchkins as being just as vindictive and cruel as the witch's army. It almost implies equal fault in a senseless conflict. Money, a song about greed and the inherent immorality of wealth, plays during both the introduction to Munchkinland and the introduction to the Emerald City. It calls the apparent wonderfulness of these places into question in a really interesting way. These are the kinds of things that people cite when they're talking about how cool of an experience Dark Side of the Rainbow is, but what they tend not to mention is all the dead air in between those mind-blowing moments. Uh, so much of the movie passes by with me like sitting at my computer, thinking as hard as I can, trying to find anything that might maybe count as a sink. Worse than dead air, though, are the moments that seem to achieve the complete tonal opposite of what the movie is trying to do. 
Somewhere Over the Rainbow, one of the most iconic songs in human history. It's this melancholy ballad about wishing your circumstances were different and looking forward to the day when you have the power to control your own life. It's underscored by On the Run, which is a five minute song that's just like the same grating synth arpeggio, like over and over and over again. It's the worst. The same thing for the emotional heart of the movie. The scene where the wizard is giving out gifts to protagonists, once again, it's on the run. It totally robs the scene of any of its triumph or relief. It just makes you feel, makes you feel bad. It's zero out of 10, I don't like it. It's a bad experience. All said, the movie earned 52 points, which divided by its 102 minute runtime gives us a Floyd quotient of 0.51. going nice and fast. In trying to emulate Griffin McElroy's sync point for Paul Blart Mall Cop 2, I used one specific thing he said to match the timing of his viewing. But Breathe in the Air, the second track in the album, uh, has sort of this long, very sad intro that is like a pretty good uh, like background for Paul Blart's life falling apart. And the lyrics to that song kick on, I am not kidding you, the frame that the mom gets hit by the car. With that as the only point of reference, that makes the start time a little weird. It makes it right there. I won't go into too much detail regarding all the cool moments in this viewing because I think Griffin himself does a pretty good job of chronicling them in the podcast, but the major highlights include Cirque du Soleil kicking up their giant stage show during Great Gig in the Sky. Paul Blart getting attacked by a bird set to brain damage. It's fucking the coolest. There is, I have one point of contention though. Early on, there's a moment that Griffin McElroy claims happens like this. But on my viewing, it happens a little bit more like this. Like this. I don't know what I want to do for that, if I should gesture or not. This is a good time to bring up that syncs aren't always going to be down to the moment replicable. The album might have slightly different periods of silence between songs, depending on where you're listening to them. If the movie's audio and the album's audio are playing at different bit rates, it can make the audio start to creep out of sync over time. Any number of things could have happened that would result in that less than a second discrepancy. And he also just left out one of the best parts. It looks like we've come to a fork in the road. What? Paul Blart Mall Cop 2 scored 54 points, which divided by 94 minutes gives us an FQ of 0.59, which is actually slightly higher than the Wizard of Oz score. I found that Dark Side of the Moon is fun to watch with movies because there's an inherent drama within it. The album has something like a dramatic arc, and even though it's not telling a story per se, it still mirrors and mimics the dramatic arcs of something like film. Most films follow pretty universal story guidelines. A typical scene in a film, or any story really, is made up of some kind of introduction, a buildup, a climax, and then a catharsis. A typical movie will have a three-act structure, with each act containing similar arcs. And if you're doing it right, the film overall should behave the same way, with an introduction and a buildup to a climax, and then sort of a denouement coming off the end. The same can be said for Dark Side of the Moon. 
Each song has an intro, a strong build-up, a dramatic climax before mellowing out in the outro. And like a movie, the same can also be said of the album as a whole. It stands to reason that depending on the length and structure of the movie, Dark Side of the Moon might very well mimic the dramatic arc of the story. Not to mention that a typical movie is about an hour and a half to two hours long, which gives you the time to listen to the album about three times, typically. So it can, it can really, really strictly mirror the, one of the three acts of the story. Oh, Lord. Some. Are you getting these? These nice mouth sounds? Good. It would be radical if we could get sponsored by Skittles. Shrek has one of my favorite moments in this entire experiment, but all in all, it's just not as exciting as most of the other subjects. Most of the movie goes by without much that's particularly exciting. There are some fun moments, but they're separated by these long swaths of... Swaths? Is that how you say that? Swaths? Is that correct? Give me some feedback. <laughs> swaths? Okay. But they're separated by long swaths of movie where the music is just this obtrusive white noise and you've been sitting at your computer for like eight hours listening to Pink Floyd and you start to wonder if anybody except for you cares about this whole weird experiment you're doing. But I don't know, I might be bringing my own baggage to that. Let me just give you some of the highlights though. It's interesting to me, actually, because the first song on the album, Breathe, uh, ends up conveying pretty much the exact opposite of what's being shown on screen. It's this very existential song about feeling stuck and worrying that you're running out of time in your life. Put over footage of Shrek being perfectly content, exactly where he is. He's fighting to be left alone. <laughs> Um, like I said in that interlude, the mellow opening of the album will often mirror the opening's two movies in terms of energy, but not necessarily in terms of tone. During that same song at the beginning of other films, we see, for example, Dorothy hating the environment she's being raised in and yearning to escape to somewhere else. We see Jack Torrance struggling to make his writing career take off and worrying that it never will. We see Thor's entire people destroyed and the reality of his real responsibility crashing down on him. And we see Paul Blart's wife get hit by a car or something. I already can't remember what happens in Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. But Shrek is just enjoying his bug dinner and his earwax candles like a normal guy would. Just like a movie, Dark Side of the Moon rises and falls. There's tension and release. It has all the things that make a narrative story satisfying. But what differentiates stories from each other is the content within those structures. Dark Side of the Moon touches on lots of universal themes and broad emotional ideas, which just happen to line up with some particular stories more than others. Shrek just starts in a different place than the other movies on the list, and in a different place than Dark Side of the Moon does. Shrek only scored 37 points, divided by 92 minutes that gives it an FQ of 0.41. But that low score is nothing compared to the god. Which only scored 70 points in its grueling 175 minute runtime, giving it the lowest FQ of the whole experiment of 0.40. The Godfather is an absolute chore. There's not really much to say about it. It's a much more subdued movie than all the other ones on the list. There's not a lot of strong physical actions for the album to sort of Mickey Mouse, so a lot of the time the music just serves as like bland wallpaper. The Godfather wrestles with a lot more complicated emotional beats than the other movies on this list too, um, and often in a really subdued sort of slow burn kind of way. It's not a very outwardly emotional movie, so pairing it with an album that is a pretty rawly emotional piece of music 
it just, it's not quite a balanced breakfast. Infinity War scored a .691, and which really makes it not look so good for Wizard of Oz. Infinity War is the antithesis of The Godfather. It's a broad movie with big actions and wide emotions. The action is non-stop. You get almost no time to rest in this movie, which gives it a strong advantage. In my system, which I realized was more and more flawed the longer this experiment went on, moments that were rhythmically in sync were worth the most points. And there are just so many punches, crashes, explosions, and disintegrations in this movie, it would be almost impossible for it not to score high. Magnificent! I sense sadness, I sense sadness. but I saved the best movie for last. The Shining is a movie that has a reputation for being overanalyzed. People say that the Indian heads on the cans in the pantry are thematically relevant. They say that this poster looks like a minotaur, and that's also important. They say that if you watch the movie forwards and backwards at the same time, then the scene where Jack talks about previous murders plays alongside the actual murder at the end of the film. Uh, people say that. I don't know why they do, but they do. I figured it was only natural that I would subject The Shining to a similarly odd viewing experience myself.
Jackson here with something I forgot to say the first time. There's a well-known conspiracy theory that Stanley Kubrick helped to fake the moon landing. Supposedly, The Shining is in part an expression of his experience having to work on that insane of a project in secret. And the 237 of room 237 represents the 237,000 miles from the Earth to the moon. And as luck would have it, right when Danny is looking at the numbers 237, the singer of Pink Floyd is saying the word moo. The Shining got 0 0.69 points, making it the highest scorer in this weird competition. Before I look at the data and crown a winner though, I want to take a second and talk about Death of the Author. It's a framework of thinking, here, just a second, I'm gonna get a drink. Oh. Yes, record those gulping noises. Nice. Uh, just a second, I gotta get the water out of my lungs before we keep going. <laughs> Death of the Author is a framework of thinking about art that says that an artist's intention is completely irrelevant, and the only thing that matters is the relationship between the work itself and the consumer. Obviously, Stanley Kubrick didn't intend for his movie to be played front to back and back to front simultaneously, but somebody did it anyway, and to them, it has meaning. That version of The Shining is a piece of work that exists outside of the author's intent, and depending on how you feel about Death of the Author, that might be completely inconsequential. Similarly, playing The Shining, or really any other movie, with Dark Side of the Moon creates what is essentially a new work, removed from any real person's intent, except for maybe you, for just thinking to put them together. Really, there isn't any author to kill. To enjoy these movies synced up to Dark Side of the Moon is really the same thing as enjoying that weird overlapped version of The Shining. It's accepting that the art has value as an experience between you and it, removed from the person who created it. The Shining won this contest in raw numbers, but now, at the end of the journey, I think the system that doled out the numbers is kind of flawed in a lot of ways. I discovered pretty quickly in my first viewings that the scoring system doesn't work perfectly in practice. In Paul Blart, money plays both times Blart visits the Weapons Expo, which is a wild and incredible coincidence, but is realistically only worth four points, whereas a strong beat syncing up with a punch in Infinity War is worth three, and I don't really think that's fair. Not to mention that many of the instances of two-pointers, which are lyrics having thematic similarities to a movie, are really open to interpretation and can be stretched to fit a lot of situations. These scores could vary really drastically because of the subjective interpretations of the criteria. I know, I know, it's astonishing. During Paul Blart, I noted that a lot of really minute circumstances can deeply affect the timing, and therefore the experiences, of these viewings. Meaning that there are many different versions of each of these movies none of them any more or less valid than the others. I want to point out this video where someone has uploaded Dark Side of the Rainbow to YouTube. In order to accommodate all of the many different sync points that people have experienced and documented over the years, they have to mess around with the timing pretty drastically. They regularly pause the album or pause the movie for just long enough to make everything work. No one start time or viewing experience is really definitive. All this is to say that the points could vary really, really drastically based on minute timing differences. But perhaps the most important flaw is this. The points in my system only accounted for similarities between the two works, but not interesting differences. Like I said about Wizard of Oz, the album adds narrative ideas to the movie. It enriches the story of the film in really interesting ways. When I set out on this experiment, I didn't assign a point value for when the music injects poignant subtext that didn't exist in the film originally. Taking these points in stride, I think I have to reevaluate my objective and intelligent judgment. 
I do really think The Wizard of Oz is the most worthwhile experience. As a film, The Wizard of Oz is kind of vacant. It has its morals at the end of the story, but other than that, it's not really about much. For the most part, it's just sort of a really episodic adventure. There's more emotional negative space for Dark Side of the Moon to fill. The other movies I compared it to are already just kind of full. They have perspectives and really specific emotional wavelengths they're trying to engage with. And adding another piece with just as much assuredness just makes it feel kind of overcrowded. Moving forward, I think the most exciting movies to pair with Pink Floyd are the ones that don't have a whole lot to say in the first place. Paul Blart Mall Cop 2 was a close runner-up in terms of how much fun I had watching it. Just because it's, it's vacuous. It's easy to impose alternate emotion onto it because it's just, it's a blank slate. I don't see how. You weren't around when I was stuffed and sewn together, were you? And I was standing over there, rusting for the longest time. Still, I wish I could remember. But I guess it doesn't matter anyway. We know each other now, don't we? That's right. We do. <laughs> to us? To us. So, uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me talk about film theory and Pink Floyd for, I don't know, 45 minutes, probably. But if you want to play along at home, it's so easy to sync up your favorite movies to Dark Side of the Moon. And, you know, pick out your favorite, your favorite comedies, your favorite adventure movies, stuff that's not, that's not super complicated. The simpler, the better, and the more fun I think you'll have with it. Goodbye. I hope you enjoyed it, and I, I hope that... I make lots of money off this video and I get really famous. That's what I hope. I'm in, I'm in it for the money. Thank you. Good night. That's it. Oh, fuck it. <laughs> I don't care. Um, yeah, sure. Let's call it there. If I want Thank you guys so much for watching. I've been working on this video in one form or another for more than a year, so finally finishing it and putting it out in front of everybody feels really, really good. All the movies I talked about in their own way are super fun to watch with Dark Side of the Moon, so if you feel inclined, have some friends over, put it on, let me know what you thought about it. This, if you, this is my call to action. If you do, leave a comment and tell me what you thought. Tell me if there were any super exciting synchronicities that I failed to mention in the video. If you for some reason still want to hear more from me, you can always check out my weekly podcast. I record it with my sister. We just sit down and we talk about a movie, different movie every week. And that's the whole premise. We're hoping that the fact that we're siblings is enough of a hook to get people interested. I've also got a handful of different talking head video essay style videos on this channel as well, which you are also welcome to check out. I do a series called A Study in Marvel, where I look at every Marvel movie ever and talk about it. And that's all. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you watching all the way to the end. It means the world to me. I hope you have a good night.